Welcome to the NAHA webinar brought to you by the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy. To learn more about NAHA, please visit www.naha.org. Tonight's presentation topic is Nourishing the Body, an Aromatherapist's Approach to Food, Herbs, and Spices. This educational webinar is being presented by Bevan Clare. Bevan is a clinical herbalist, nutritionist, mother, plant lover, and a professor at the Maryland University of Integrative Health. As an herbalist and educator, Bevan is the program director of the Masters of Science in Clinical Herbal Medicine at Maryland University of Integrative Health. She brings herbs into the lives of many students, clients, and practitioners with her national and international presentations. She holds a Master's of Science in Infectious Disease from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and has studied herbal medicine around the world, blending her knowledge of traditional uses of plants with modern science and contemporary healthcare strategies. Bevan is a board member of the United Plant Savers, a group working to protect at-risk medicinal plants in North America. She is the current president of the American Herbalist Guild, where she works to promote clinical herbalism, accessibility, and professionalism. Her newly released book, Spice Apothecary, Blending and Using Common Spices for Everyday Health, is now available for order on the Naha Bookstore Amazon link. To learn more about Bevan, please visit her website at www.bevanclare.com. And I'd like to just take a moment and welcome Bevan for being here this evening and talking to us about a really unique topic that is great for uh, everyone. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. And I'm looking forward to exploring this with you tonight. I promise to keep you awake and uh, that it'll be fun and lively. So tonight we're going to be looking at the idea of uh, if you're an aromatherapist, what do you need to know to be able to use some of these supportive tools, you know, to dabble in some of these things? And I meet a lot of aromatherapists that are also nutritionists or also herbalists, but but then there's a lot that aren't, and it's it's important, you know, if we're if we're going to be working with whole people. Um, there's different ways we can go about these things. So we're going to explore it tonight. My goal is that you'll come away with a few tools that really resonate with you, a few messages that connect with you, and you'll be able to put some of this in place in your practices, um, it, which, you know, your personal practices or your professional practices. So I will be taking questions at the end. If you have questions, feel free to um, ask those in the question box, and we'll be getting to those. Okay. So why why is nutrition important? Well, you know, it it is very fundamental, of course, to health. I'm sure none of you would say that nutrition wasn't important, but why is it important for the work of an aromatherapist? And I think the idea is that um, aromatherapy is going to work best on a receptive body, a body that has the least number of obstacles in place to be able to be well and to heal and to move towards health. So, you know, nutrition has a big part in that. And uh, as a nutritionist and an herbalist, but not necessarily an aromatherapist, I you know I can see these foundational pieces and how they all fit together. And I think that that nutrition also has a lot of fundamental healing qualities. It also, you know, energetically is really different than I think, you know, food and essential oils are are so energetically different. Even even your heavier oils are still like very ethereal. And um, and you know, food is so grounding and so nourishing. You know, sweet potatoes and beets and walnuts and things like that uh, offer a very different energetic that you can think about. Um, so you know, I, I know aromatherapists think about these energetics of their oils, but you can also think about just the energetics of all of the therapies that somebody's putting into their body and try to um, round that out a little bit with water therapies and foods and breathing and essential oils and, and all of this. Also, nutrition is, is a self-care investment. So when you're working with people that are coming to you for aromatherapy and um, 
you know, they're, they're looking for a bit of a quick fix, um, and which of course is more common in recent years, you know, that, that people are um, looking toward aromatherapy to fix complex health conditions. Um, I'm sure this is no surprise to you. And so the, um, the idea is that, you know, by using something like nutrition along with it, that people do need to make an investment in their care. It's not as simple as dropping a lot of money on some oils and sticking them in a diffuser and hoping that they will solve all of your your problems. So um, so that, those are a few reasons why I think nutrition is really relevant in this conversation. And I also need to apologize if these images make people hungry. I just ate before this for this for the sole reason that I you know, get so hungry when I do this presentation um, because it's just it looks so good. <laughs> So we're going to start by taking a look at some foundations of nutrition. There are a lot of different philosophies around nutrition, as I'm sure you're aware, and contemporary research fits into there differently. I'm going to give you my, what I would call a sensible, non-dogmatic, evidence and tradition-based approach. So I'm not really extreme in any direction. I'm also not saying that this is the best diet for everyone or that this is the only good diet. but I'm going to try to bring in some useful tips, especially if you're going to be counseling people on just a few healthy, nourishing practices that they can have. Um, and we'll, we're going to look at scope of practice, too. So one of the first things I want to talk about is just, you know, these fruits and veggies. They are, you know, they are the rainbow in your diet. You know, if you're not completely in love with the things in this image, and of course, here's a lot of aromatherapy right here, peeling the citrus and delighting and all of that. But, um, but yeah, fruits and veggies, you know, those rainbows, those are a rainbow of, of phytonutrients and micronutrients and um, phytopharmaceuticals and, and all sorts of nourishing, wonderful chemicals that that speak with your body and i and i always say that this is um very true for food herbs and uh and, and oils that people and plants speak the same language and that's that the language of biochemistry and um and so you know these things these pigments speak to your body in a lot of different ways and can create profound health change so you know the 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 more rich in color a food is, the more micronutrient dense it is. It's a pretty easy parallel to make. Um, you know, if you think about all of the foods that are less micronutrient dense, um, they're pretty much, they're often a low in color and they're quite bland. So, you know, those micronutrient dense foods looking at rich color and deep color in your food and a diversity of color is one of the most simple nutrition strategies. And rainbow sprinkles on ice cream do not count. I'm sorry to inform you of that, that, uh, that I got word that um, those apparently are not going to sit in for all of your rainbow fruits and veggies. Some of these jokes are so much. I'm just picturing all of you laughing at home, and that's helping me I'm sorry, right now. I, I had to come off. I had to come off mute and laugh at that. I thought that was so funny. So, um, how about the chocolate just, ones? I think the chocolate ones are okay. The chocolate ones, yeah, those are those are there's polyphenols in those, that's so you're funny. okay. Yeah, you okay. got that. Um, sorry, sorry for bursting out. No, that's okay. <laughs> So, so you can basically fill your life with these, you know, with this rainbow of um, of fruits and veggies, and and create that. And also, they, they can be very seasonal. So, thinking about what's happening in the season, there's a lot of correlation between what's ripening around you and what your body needs, um, and that's pretty fantastic. So, you know, the spring, all those early greens and bitter greens are really helpful. In the fall, you get a lot of root vegetables and squashes and um, they, so, so what's happening seasonally makes a lot of sense around you. Um, so carbs and um, and carbs are you know the most contentious of all of the the food groups, and you know they 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 don't have to be so contentious. And it really, it comes down to that you know carbohydrates can be oatmeal, they can be Cheetos, they, they can be sweet potatoes, they can be you know, all sorts of Twinkies, mostly carbohydrates. Um, so there's a lot of these different things that are carbohydrates. And what it comes down to is their complexity. Um, and it also comes down to how intact they are. So you know, if you if you think about it, most carbohydrates are 
they're coming with a, a lot of nutrient density, especially seeds. In the seeds, with the outside of the seed, the germ comes with a huge amount of protein and nutrient density. So, you know, the germ on rice or um, farro or wheat berries um, or whole, you know, the wheat berry, whole wheat, things like that. So you get a, a lot of nutrients from those. But one of the best things about, about carbs is if you think about those whole intact seeds can be very blood sugar regulating and sustaining and very low processed and nourishing. Um, but really what you want to think about is it's much more about quality over quantity. So I know people are often limiting their carbs and they're counting carbs. Um, I think that that's not, not a bad thing to do, but I think it's much more important to think about what are those carbs that you're actually getting. And um, I put the picture of corn up here as an example. I mean, carbs can range all the way from caro corn syrup to this beautiful uh, indigenous corn that is so full of anthocyanins and beautiful chemistry and pigments. And it's just absolutely a, a rich and wonderful food source. So it's really hard to say, you know, corn is bad or potatoes are bad or things like that. Um, you know, other than the rainbow jimmies, it's really, those are actually kind of carby too. Um, but the rainbow sprinkles, I just gave myself away as a New Englander, by the way, we call them jimmies in New England. Um, sprinkles everywhere else, but I translate that for you. So the carbs piece, it's really about the complexity of them. That's what you want to think about. When you think about fats, um, you know, there's a, depending on your age, you can remember a lot of fat-free stuff happening. Fat-free was the, really the worst thing that ever happened to our nutrition um, in the United States. We, you know, we we got incredibly fat during the fat-free time because of just you know being hungry and dry all the time. Um, but fats are what keep us moist and juicy and plump and you know, th those are important things for your skin and um, your hair and things like that, but also for your nervous system and so on. And so there's a lot of different types of fats. There's, you know, your nuts and seeds and avocados are just wonderful. As a aromatherapist, you're familiar with your base oils, which gives you a really good idea about quality. Um, something I love about aromatherapists is I don't have to lecture them about how oils are actually extracted. Um, people don't realize the difference between something like olive oil that's, you know, cold pressed and something that is chemically extracted, um, like canola oil often is, or soy oil or things like that. So you all are generally familiar with the idea that there are um, better, superior extraction methods. But you know, you want to think about some of these as very therapeutic. You know, there's a lot of of um, incredibly nourishing things in an avocado, or, or avocado oil, or walnuts and walnut oil, um, olives, oil, olive oil, and olives, things like that. That you know, fats have have a, an ability to be very grounding and very moistening um, broadly, which I think is is so important. And that's you know both topically and internally. Um, protein is really important to think about, and it can mean a lot of different things to a, a lot of different people, uh, whether it's animal or vegetable. There's wonderful sources of animal and vegetable protein. I think that it's a question of how, how people often think about how much they need, but we do know that um, that you know we, we do know we need some, but oftentimes we eat far more than we need, uh, especially of, of animal proteins. Um, but there are a lot of different ways that we can get protein, and it really depends on what works for you, both your your ethics and your body and your cultural heritage. But I do want to put a huge plug in for beans. I think beans are in, incredibly underused. They're so delicious and affordable, um, especially if you buy you know dry beans and really make make them well. Um, there's lots of different kinds, and again, they can be really high in, in excellent phytonutrients. So learning how to cook beans properly um, by soaking and rinsing and things like that can be a great skill. Um, and as a nutritionist, if you're if you're trying to to lose weight um, or you're trying to just maintain a healthy weight balance, that you know e increasing your bean consumption can be really good um, for in lots of different ways. And and just you know trying to find lots of different ways to do it. Also, I live in a house with a um, seven and a 10 year old. So eating a lot of beans makes me very popular. You can guess why they think that's, my kids think that that's just the best thing ever when mommy is gorging on beans. So, which I usually am. So that you can also entertain people and your children. Um, 
Then there's also the ecological health idea, and that comes down to thinking about protein and where it comes from and the quality, um, the, the life of the animals if you're eating animals and so on. So these are nutrition concepts. Um, they may not be just about your own personal nutrition, but kind of broader. And then there's micronutrients, which are so important. And this is just all of the, the phytochemical magic that's in your food. And you know, with, with wild plants, when we go look at wild plants, which was of course our diet for much of our, our existence as human beings, um, the you know, wild plants are just absolutely packed with complicated, diverse phytochemicals and a lot of them, which is why they're kind of almost unpalatable. and wild tasting and, and our palates have kind of um, g adjusted to this much more bland you know even if even if you're eating kale and things like that it's still significantly more bland than what the wild mustards um would have been like that that it, it would have been bred from and so you know so we really need to think about that when we're thinking about what we actually are eating is like you know whether our food has the same wildness in it and because not because wildness is you know anything more than awesome energetics but it's it's because it, that's where a lot of these excellent phytonutrients are coming from is um at least it's re, it's re remembrance of what you know what was as far as its its um, own genetics. So you know when you when you eat a a beet or something like that, you get all of that wonderful red pigment that's been there um, since the beginning. So there's there's a lot of wonderful nutrient dense foods. There's some nice pictures of some in there. And thinking about per you know how much how much nutrient how much nutrition how many nutrients am I getting per like calorie, even though calories are not a great concept, it does tell you how much energy is in that food. So if you are gonna eat like just the inside of a potato or something like that, you're getting not a lot of nutrient density, but quite a few calories. If you eat an entire potato with skin, that you actually get a much higher um, nutrient density. Uh, but look at the, some of these foods like figs and, and eggs and grapes and meat and things like that, you can actually get quite a high nutrient density, your choice, um, how you feel, feel like doing that. Um, also, there's a lot of foods that are called superfoods. I think, you know, you can decide there's a lot more superfoods that aren't on the superfood bandwagon, but finding those superfoods and adding more to your life is really important. If there's a first principle of nutrition that I like to uh, adhere to, it's that I don't ask people usually to take things away, I ask them to add things. And this can be a nice one for you. You know, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about our um, our diets and the things that we shouldn't be doing. And, and, you know, those might be true, but it's actually better sometimes to just think about the things that we should and adding in those good things. And as aromatherapists, this is also a really good line to walk because telling people to stop doing things uh, is is tricky. It's a, almost out of your scope of practice. But telling people that you know to, to maybe add in a nourishing food or sharing some information about you know top ten superfoods that they can add in is a great way to um, reduce systemic inflammation and just support overall health. And sometimes I find that you do this, you add things, and that people step away from things that aren't as beneficial for them. Um, sometimes because they can't just simply can't. Uh, eat that much food if you add something else to it. But sometimes I think they just feel better um, and that that makes them want to eat well. So if you're, you know, you're an aromatherapist, thinking about your scope, um, what does that mean? You know, you know your scope as aromatherapist. The most important thing is that you don't want to make claims for for people if you're gonna be talking about these foods. So, you know, it's fine to say like these, these are some of the foods that are considered superfoods. And, um, you know, you can read about some of the things they've shown and share them a little article or a handout. Um, you, could, you could share them a website or things like that. You can also um, tell them that these are traditionally eaten to support um, a healthy nervous system or to support a healthy inflammatory response or things like that. 
um, that they're traditionally used that way. But really the most important thing is you just want to make sure that you're only claiming to support health. Like this is all you want to do. You never want to make a recommendation to help, um, you know, cure disease or get rid of a disease or something like that. So, so you, you can almost think of framing it as like, this can be used to support a healthy digestive system or a healthy nervous system or um, a healthy stress response or something like that. I mentioned adding instead of subtracting. It's always worth adding that in again here. Uh, you know, when you're working with people, be really specific. Like if you, if you tell people to eat more fruits and veggies, they're like, oh, okay. You know, like they haven't heard that before already. If you're going to be recommending things, think about what you might want to recommend. And I think you can think about it even in the context of aromatherapy. I mean, you can think about what you're trying to accomplish and um, start to think about some of the foods that might actually fit well into that, um, into that picture of your recommendations. Um, so, you know, that sounds good. But I also, I'm just thinking about in aromatherapy, let's say that you're using things um, that are lighter and um, more heady for people that, you know, you might want to think about like greens and flowers and, and things like that in the diet and things, you know, that are that are more just fresh and springy and light um, versus things that if you're if you're looking at at something that's much more grounding and centering, um, there's a lot of foods that are like that, too. And then, of course, you can work with an aroma, with an with a nutritionist as an aromatherapist. That's a great way to to also partner with people. The two things go so well together. Okay, so we're going to move on. That's all you need to know about nutrition. Um, we're going to move on to aromatherapy. Um, sorry, to herbal medicine for aromatherapists. And so I love looking at this. This is this is going to be so fun, and I hope you enjoy it as well. So this is like my super pretend chart, <laughs> um, but um, it, this is just a little bit of the point why I think aromatherapists, it's great for them to pay attention to herbal medicine because, um, and actually really it, nutrition, although nutrition doesn't use a lot of, a lot of the things you use in aromatherapy are not actually edible, um, but there's there's this whole piece of all of these other plant constituents. And I think there's certain plants like peppermint, for example, where, you know, aromatherapy's really got it with peppermint. I mean, that's even, you know, as herbalists, we essentially, we just want to extract those volatile oils out of it. Um, and we do that with tea and all sorts of other things, but we're really actually trying to limit the tannins and, um, and so on. So it, the, but, but with a lot of the other herbs you use, I think about um, the oils and I'm like, oh my gosh, they're missing so much good stuff in there. And, uh, and it makes me just, you know, I wanna, I wanna turn all of you onto that. And, and I just love the idea of using the oil as well as the plants. So you get that whole piece. Because one of the things I think we miss out on um, when we extract any type of single plant constituent or group of constituents is we lose out on the synergy that's present in the whole plant. Now that may be compensated for by the concentration that you're able to use in an oil, but at the same time, you know, there is this kind of plant chemistry magic that happens with all of those things together. Um, uh, and so I think it's really nice to think about the whole thing actually, actually going together. So. Um, all right, so the first part of herbal medicine, we're going to look at spices, and then we're going to look at things that aren't spices. And I love this, um, you know, this is really like, spices are right in the middle between food and medicine. They're actually right in the middle between aromatherapy and, um, and herbalism. So spices are kind of like bridge walkers, and, and I love that, you know, you're not going to sit there and eat all those spoon fills. Um, at least, you know, some of them are a little hard to chew up at least. But at the same time, you know, it's hard to say they're not food. So so spices have this great bridge walking ability. And I, I think so much about how we can use these spices in our herbal medicine and in our aromatherapy. And sometimes they're a logical choice. And I, I was um, chatting right before the webinar and remembering a time when I was at an aromatherapy conference and someone was talking about the challenges of using cilantro essential oil and and some of the benefits but how difficult it was to use and you know was there really a, like the 
how to best use this. And I was thinking, you just make guacamole or something, you know, you put a put a bunch of cilantro in that or cilantro pesto or something. There's, you know, sometimes it just makes sense to go straight for those, those highly aromatic plants. So, so here's cinnamon. This is a plant that's kind of held closely by all of us. Um, and cinnamon is so wonderful. I know that you have a whole bunch of cinnamons. We really, I mean, cinnamon is used uh, all species of culinary and medicinal cinnamon are used for medicine, but some of them um, are better than others for sure. So we tend to use the um, the cinnamomum verum is the one that we use, the true cinnamon. And this this is a little bit less spicy, a little bit more mild, and a little bit more sweet um, as a medicine. But it doesn't have the coumarins in it that some of the other um, cinnamons and cassias do. So that's what, why we tend to use cinnamon and verum. And cinnamon is really interesting just because, uh, you, you know, it's not necessarily just the volatile oils at all. It's actually a whole number of different compounds that can induce, um, they, they can help to nurture health. So particularly some of the compounds that are really helpful for supporting blood sugar. Um, so, so that's really the primary use of cinnamon in herbal medicine is we love to use cinnamon and we need to use it in its whole form um, to support blood sugar management. So there's lots of research on this. There's research on um, stabilizing hemoglobin A1C numbers in a diabetic or um, pre-diabetic population. There's even um, information on working memory time um, after eating. So this kind of postprandial um, brain fog that people get with cinnamon being really helpful for that. So if that's you, I know that that feels like me, especially when I'm doing a webinar sometimes, you know, you just suddenly are like, wait, what am I talking about? In herbal medicine, we think of it as good for sluggishness, all different kinds of sluggishness. So uh, it is it is a blood mover. It's actually seen as like a blood nourisher and a blood mover around the body. Um, I imagine that cinnamon might be helpful in aromatherapy for something a little bit similar, uh, though I don't know. But um, cinnamon, you know, it, it, we even use it for women that have um, menstrual cycles that are difficult to kind of come on. Um, where they just feel like oh, they're going to explode right before them, and cinnamon can be hot and moving. Um, it also is just a wonderful carminative, so it's helpful for digestion and gas and bloating. Um, and, and it's not a surprise that we put cinnamon in a lot of foods that are difficult to digest. Um, that's why cinnamon buns are incredibly therapeutic, because they have all the cinnamon. Well, maybe not, but they are really, really good. And it is all about the cinnamon. I mean, cinnamon buns without cinnamon I don't, I mean, I, that's like a terrifying idea. They feel white and bland, but you know, you put cinnamon in with butter and all of this and it's, it's pretty awesome. So, but we do put cinnamon in also things like apples, which are considered very energetically cold um, and difficult for some people to digest. So it's, it's fun to see some of the things that we do with cinnamon. I love cinnamon enough. I named my daughter after cinnamon, by the way, her, her, um, her genus, her genus is Cassia. Um, and uh, so that's actually her first name, her genus. And that is the different, Cinnamomum was a little bit eccentric for me. So it's the other the other genus of, of cinnamon. So chilies, um, these, you know, you might, I'm sure there's mixed relation, mixed relationships out there about chilies. You know, some people are like, hmm, delicious. Other people are thinking, oh, no, no chilies. Um, that looks like it hurts. And so chilies are very interesting as far as um, their powers in, in herbal medicine. Um, you know, they're used both contemporarily and traditionally. So traditionally, chilies were very popular in um, early American medicine because it was viewed that, um, that, that really life was hot and death was cold. So, the, you know, I can't disagree with this, although it's a little oversimplistic, but energetically, that was the idea is that like to, to keep life and warmth um, and heat, you know, you would move things and otherwise, you know, you could succumb to, to cold, static death. And um, so, so chilies were used in a lot of different ways. I mean, if you're familiar with Back to Eden and Jethro Kloss, 
Um, there is just a huge amount of cayenne, cayenne eye washes and enemas and gargles and things like that. And, but we, you know, we still use it and capsaicin cream is available at a pharmacy. It's a pharmaceutical um, to help with pain. So we also use cayenne topically as a rubefacient, probably aromatherapy, you do this as well. Um, and we use cayenne for help with pain and inflammation. Interestingly, in the diet, it's pretty pretty fascinating that you know adding chilies to your food um, not only it makes it like harder to eat a ton of it because it's it is stronger tasting, but you do actually feel fuller faster. It does affect leptin and and ghrelin cycles, so you actually feel you you feel you reach your full fullness earlier. Um, and so people do eat less because of that. So that's really interesting, and they feel fuller from it. We also use um, it, you know, chilies a lot to prevent inflammation. There's a lot of great pigments and medicine in them. And I should add right now, you know, chilies do not have to be spicy. I use a lot of ancho chili. If you've never used ancho chili, it's very, very mild. In fact, I can use like a half cup of ancho chili in a recipe, and um, my very anti-spice child will will gobble that up so you know chilies can actually ancho chilies are very mild um, there are some other mild chilies as well and then of course there's lots of really hot chilies but it can be fun to to learn to love them chilies can also impact our metabolism um, they can change you know how we're really processing the dietary inputs and and otherwise so they can it can be pretty interesting if you like chili if you've never tried taking quite a bit of it over a period of time it can be fascinating who knows what will happen to you but um but there's a lot of interesting um anecdotal information and it is wonderful for inflammation um, and of course it can cool you down i mean that's the idea with a lot of people eating in the hottest places in the world people eat spicy food because it does kind of turn on your natural cooling systems I'm sure you've heard of turmeric and um, turmeric is such a powerhouse of um, therapies. There's, I mean, I, I could go on and on I and mean, I have hours and hours of presentations just on turmeric, but it is so wonderful for inflammation. And, um, but it, you know, it's a little persnickety about how you prepare it. And so it does, you, you, if you think about how turmeric is prepared traditionally, it's almost, it's always really heated with some kind of fat. And often there's some kind of spicy thing in with it, like a little bit of black pepper or cardamom or something like that. And it really needs that to be bioavailable. So with turmeric, you do need to have it heated up like with a fat or an oil um, and something spicy, and then it becomes bioavailable um, and most effective. But, you know, turmeric is a wonderful anti-inflammatory. It's, I mean, it's really an anti-mutagenic and it can be used um, as an epigenetic modifier. So meaning, you know, you know, you have the genes in your body and how these actually express uh, depends on a lot of lifestyle inputs. And turmeric is one of these things that can be helpful to um, prevent the expression of certain things that are harmful. So if you, if you're into this, you know, turmeric is very inexpensive. You don't need fancy products, but you can, I mean, you can get higher um, amounts of curcumin from fancy products, but you can also just get turmeric. Um, and, and there's a lot of different ways to prepare this. Uh, in my book, which I'm gonna share later, they we talk about a lot of different ways to do this. With blood sugar management, this is another one. There's a, a great study where they looked at a huge group of people who were all um, diagnosed as pre-diabetic. And so they had one arm who just went with like normal, um, you know, recommendations about diet and so on. And then one arm who had the same recommendations, but they also took a couple of capsules of turmeric. And by the end of the time period, which was um, nine months, about 25% of the pre-diabetic people in the, um, in the placebo group were pre -diabetic, were diabetic, but no one in the intervention group, in the turmeric group, ended up being diabetic, just from that little bit of turmeric. So it's, it's pretty awesome. So adaptogens is a really fun concept, and it's one of the things that herbal medicine has going for it. It's one of the real bonuses, and that's adaptogens are these substances that help the body to adapt to stress and exert a normalizing effect on bodily processes. So um, so this is this is really important because it's great for when stress when stress just starts to impact so many aspects of your life. 
um, it's, you know, it'd be interesting to look at it if we ever had something like a global pandemic and let's say people were super stressed out and um, just overall elevated levels of stress. And you see that impacting people's sleep quality, impacting their diet, impacting um, their mental health, impacting all of these things. Um, adaptogens can, I always think of them as like thickening the veil. Like they, they help separate your physiological responses from the stressors that are happening all around you. Um, and, you know, so, so they are absolutely um, amazing. And a lot of the early research on these were done in, in the Soviet Union where they would take these massive factories and they would you know, kind of make people take these and study them. And they found that people um, were happier and they were more productive and they were less injured. And um, they, all of this, it goes on and on. So it's, it's pretty profound to take a look at that. So my favorite adaptogen is probably ashwagandha, um, probably something you don't use in aromatherapy because uh, the, um, the, the word somniferum, it means smells like a horse. I'm sorry, actually, it's a withania that means smell like a horse. With somniferum means deep sleep. So um, so it does smell like a horse, kind of. Um, but but withania and our ashwagandha is amazing for, for its calming and energizing at the same time. So if you're somebody who is exhausted, but you're also highly anxious, and you feel like you're kind of burning up all your energy through anxiety and stress, um, Withania can be one of the most helpful things. Ashwagandha can be one of the most helpful things to um, to take a look at. And so it's really restorative. It's helpful for anxiety. It's helpful for sleep. It's a great thing to start your day off with first thing in the morning. And it just allows you to have a much more smooth day. And I think it's really, it's very noticeable for people. And people just take, you know, two, three grams of ashwagandha. Um, and I think it really helps. I mean, you know, joking aside about the potential pandemic thing, when, you know, when everything did really happen, and I know that those were incredibly stressful times for everybody. Um, for me, I could just feel this heightened stress response. I mean, there was just, you know, fear. And um, and I was amazed as soon as I turned to adaptogens, how that shifted for me. Another adaptogen is reishi and um, Ganoderma lucidum, probably another one you probably don't use in aromatherapy because it it's it's uh, not very pleasant. Um, not that all things are pleasant, but it is kind of intense. And feel free to correct me; I'd love to learn. Um, so reishi is is basically a therapeutic biofactory. It just does everything. Um, we could go; I could go on and on. But it, it's a wonderful immune support, and it is extremely safe and well tolerated. In fact, there's no known toxicity to it. Um, to, the only way it could hurt you is if you took so much of it, you choked on it, <laughs> something like that. But for real, the toxic, the toxicology data, it, it's basically non-toxic. And it also just shows to be really helpful. So there's, um, there's an excellent um, summary article taking a look at how effective it is in um, cancer treatments as a therapy. Um, and what they found was that it's, it actually greatly improves people's quality of life. And that's pretty amazing. So that, you know, as an adjunct in cancer therapy, it's gonna improve quality of life um, and potentially also as its own cancer therapy because it does have anti-cancer activity. But, um, but the quality of life piece is incredibly important. Um, and um, yeah, I'm trying to think of the, the name of the publication that that came in, but I'll have to think about it. And it also is wonderful as um, liver support, so it can help with blood lipid levels and hepatic support as an anti-inflammatory and so on. So this is a really, and also um, blood sugar levels. So it's really this, this perfect thing. And because of its safety and it's how well tolerated it is, it's something I feel like you can recommend very freely to people. Um, it used to be that people years ago, you know, you find out you're an herbalist or aromatherapist or something, and then they're always say, oh, my cousin has cancer or something like that. And I would always say, you should see a qualified herbalist. Now I still say, we well, should see a qualified herbalist, but you should also check out Rishi. It would be a really good idea because it pretty much is always a good idea. Um, you've heard of ginseng, I'm sure. There, you know, ginseng is um, a wonderful kind of energetic invigorating herbal medicine that's helpful for um, fatigue. And it's also very seen as very protective for our respiratory system. Um, 
and that's that's important. Um, so a lot of different types of conditions, such as um, pneumonia, can be very depleting, and the, a lot of respiratory conditions. And panax ginseng is seen as kind of being protective to the to the lung tissue, and so it's wonderful like that. So um, I want to talk about demulcents for a moment. I think that this is these are like the um, the opposite of essential oils and uh, and these are our slimy cool moist gooey herbal medicines and they're pretty amazing I mean, if you think about how many conditions do we have that are due to heat and inflammation um, a lot almost all of them in some ways and these are like the the opposite and um, so so I'm gonna just mention two of them one is chia and um, if you're not familiar with chia, it's wonderful to play with. My kids think it's dessert. I make chia pudding, um, literally with combining chia and water and then putting a little vanilla um, in it. And there's, so chia is just so gooey and wonderful for your gut and your respiratory system. Uh, and I think that this is a really nice thing, especially if people are very hot or dry, um, to add something like that to recommend it. There's a ton of recipes for how to use chia online. Um, in Latin America, it's used pretty extensively just in day-to-day -day cooking and preparations. Also, marshmallow is another one. Uh, marshmallow is super slimy and wonderful for any type of irritation in the respiratory tract, the urinary tract, and the gut, you know, like a dry cough. Um, marshmallow is just wonderful for. So you get all of this beautiful moistening demulcency um, and it's very sustainable and and I just I think like this picture of this person it just really kind of cools and moistens if you're if you're all hot and dry and then we do have a bunch of nutritives and tonics and so I think that that's you know one of the things that balances aromatherapy is something like you know using nutritives and nutritives can be so important so nettles is one of my favorites. I have lots of nettles growing outside my home. Um, and they are just, they're so nourishing and they're a wonderful herbal tea. They are, you know, they're a pretty, a, a pretty lovable green other than the fact that they sting you, um, you can see. So I, if you think, if you don't like them stinging you, I can, you can wear gloves, but I can also remind you that they actually, these are not thorns. I mean, they are actual little hypodermic syringes that trigger a release of formic acid into your body. And this is the same as bee stings. Like the sting can actually be extremely therapeutic and people have used nettle stings for many years. But I like to say that once you do that, you have plant power. Um, and as my kids were stung by nettles repeatedly as children, because I grow them around my house, they, um, they learned that they had plant power injected inside their body. And so they have those superpowers. So if you if you find having another superpower appealing, I definitely recommend getting stung by nettles a little bit. Also, if you're just a plant geek, I mean, if you just think plants are so amazing, going and getting stung by nettles is actually pretty fun. Um, so you can tell what I do for fun. So nettles are incredibly nourishing as a tea. They taste very green. Um, people have all sorts of interesting reactions to them, but it is just like, you know, it is a multivitamin in a, in a, in a glass of tea, a cup of tea. And there's also, they're very helpful for allergies and allergy season. Um, and they're very helpful for supporting our tissues and, and healing um, tissues. Astragalus is another kind of nourishing tonic. It's a safe for long-term immune tonic that just helps to kind of fortify the immune system overall. It's a nice herb to be taking um, right now, and you can also cook with it quite a bit. And it is, you know, sweet and pretty tasty. So it's, it's an easy one to love. Red raspberry is another. It's the leaf of red raspberry that's used, and um, it is seen as a tonic, um, and it's great for women's health and digestion. Um, I really love, um, I really love red raspberry. I think it's, um, it, it's a very tasty iced tea because it's a little bit astringent, just like, um, just like black tea is. So it works really well. It's probably my favorite herbal iced tea. So if you, if you're thinking that this is not herb tea season because it's so hot, then you should definitely consider trying, um, herbal iced teas because they can be they can be really, really fun to, to try them. So 
Um, so that they are definitely one of my one of my very favorites. Um, so I wanted to talk about the herbal medicine scope of practice, and I also wanted to spend a minute talking a little bit about um, some of the spices and how you know spices really fit into this too, because I realized I didn't spend as much time as I could have earlier on that. Um, so herbal medicine, I think in general is very complementary to essential oils. You know, when, when we're looking at essential oils, if you think about the overall um, therapeutic kind of spectrum of what's possible, I think that there is essential, there's herbal medicines that kind of fit, that just nestle along with that, that are just, you know, expand that scope a little further. Demulsants are a great example where, you know, you don't, as far as I know, you don't have any slimy essential oils. Um, and so how great to think about these slimy um, herbs or seeds along with your essential oils to provide something that might be a little bit more balanced or a little bit more comprehensive for someone. And then there's also the nourishing piece. Um, everything I recommended makes, you know, is, is safe and has high impact. So you know, it's nice to have a few different recommendations so that, that people can find different ways of working with this and what's, you know, what's appropriate and what's going to make the most sense um, for them as individuals. I also think that their, their herbal medicine is very foundational, just like nutrition, that it's, it's kind of where we started. And, um, you know, while I use essential oils here and there, I use a lot of, I think, aromatherapy through the use of spices and herbs as therapeutic medicine. So I love making, you know, wild pestos and I love getting out in the garden and nibbling on things that are aromatic and, of course, smelling things and experiencing things. And it's it's one of the things that I think that we've lost in our integrative medicine and in our herbal medicine um, is the sensory piece. I mean, you know, I always think that um, it makes me really sad when I go into like a Whole Foods or um, a health food store kind of thing, and I'm in the herbal medicine section, and the you know bath like a a spray or something that somebody's been spraying, but usually it doesn't actually smell like anything in there. Um, it's just a you know there's no actual living plant experiences versus you go to a garden or you go to a um, urban spice market anywhere in the world that's more traditional and there's you know bins of things and it's incredibly pungent and aromatic and and people you know choose these things by looking at them and what we tend to do is you know we put them all in little capsules and um, and we remove that experience you know you buy cinnamon or you buy garlic or things like that so I love aromatherapy that that's not typically what's happening I and mean, people are not trying to like hide the smell of oils so that you don't have to smell them um so, you know but herbal medicines you know we can learn a little bit of, uh, from that but i think spices are where that fits in really well that spices are you know the, the middle bridge between these and they are sensory i mean you aren't going to be like oh i want to add some garlic and oregano to my pizza i should put it in a capsule before i do that you know you put it in there and you let them create synergy and work together um, and and create a lot of medicine. And I think that you can you can fill your life with a lot of these. And that's um, you know the, the, the thing I, I most like to emphasize about spices is that um, more is better. You know, there, there's a lot of times we say moderation, more isn't better. With spices, more is better. It's just great to go with a lot more spices. Um, fill your life with with spices and and that can be fresh spices or dried spices and they're safe as long as you're eating them um you know some of the spices actually if you start encapsulating them and concentrating them can have some of the same contraindications that doing so even with oils could have because they have such high levels of um of volatile compounds but and, and other things also too especially any of the apac um herbs like parsley and um and anise and fennel and dill and things like that coriander uh can be can you can dose them too high but you know they the spices really allow you to kind of have the best of all of these worlds with nutrition and herbal medicine and and so on so i i think that that's you know asking people to cook with more spices and so on 
The other thing that spices really play into is the idea of the terrain. So the you know the French concept of like the the terrain of the body that the body is an ecosystem, um, and that certain things will kind of shift that. And I think spices are one of the best things for that. That if you're working with people that have a lot a very cold or cooler or sweeter kind of doughy, you know they have. Um, issues with yeast sometimes and sluggishness and so on by adding a lot of spices not necessarily spicy like you know, adding warming spices like thyme and sage and rosemary and ginger and um, oregano and and things like that garlic those things can really change the overall ecosystem of the body and they can be very helpful so if you're thinking about fooling around with this I would recommend um, you can look through this, you can you can choose five things or even three things or even one thing, but you know, just choose a few things that you're really into. Uh, and herbal medicine is just like aromatherapy in the wonderful way that you definitely want to experience, in, experience these things before you recommend them to people. Um, I always think this is why we aren't pharmacists. There might be some pharmacists on the line, but like the reason why all of us aren't pharmacists is because we would be taking everything because we would want to experience it all, right? I mean, I couldn't imagine recommending a medicine that I had never like tasted or smelled or sat next to or experienced in my body. So that's a really good reason why I'm not a pharmacist and why I'm an herbalist um, or and, and aromatherapists have the same. So if, you know, don't be afraid of these herbs, go ahead and take them, um, give them to your family, you know, see, give them to your friends, ask them to tell you what their experience is, you know, guinea pig them a little bit so you can, um, you can see what happens. And that can also be the same as spices, adding a, a more therapeutic dose of spices. So choose some things, do a little bit of research, find out a little bit more about it. Um, so you can get comfortable with using it for people. Also using quality products is important. Probably another thing I don't need to say to aromatherapists, um, but it is, you know, herbs are not herbs are not herbs. And so this is the same thing as, you know, buying a, finding a $2 bottle of lavender oil or buying um, some kind of absolutely fabulous lavender oil. And, you know, there's there's a huge difference in herbs like this. So I would say that um, the best quality products are either those that come from the most amazing companies or the ones that you kind of like create yourself out of something that's from the produce department or the farmer's market or from your garden or even from your local Indian spice shop where you've bought things. Um, those are all really great places to find quality products and the and the price can range quite a bit but you you know you, you'd be surprised at what's in capsules when i see clients and they bring in capsules i have often herb capsules i have to ask if, if i can have one and then i chew it up and see what it tastes like because um because i have no idea otherwise it's like stuck in this little capsule so tasting it really gives me an idea of the the quality um and believe me it's different i once bought 20 different types of ginger capsules you think ginger is like the cheapest most ubiquitous most difficult to destroy herb and there were ginger capsules the really cheap ones that literally tasted like dirt um which was you know astonishing so so use those quality use those quality products i wanted to mention my book because um the, the team at Naha was generous and, and welcoming me to do so. So Spice of Palfacary actually came out on Tuesday. It's been really exciting. And this book looks at blending and using um, spices for everyday health. And so there's a lot of, of dosage charts around how to get the right number of grams and how to use each one of these spices and um, some of the evidence around. And then there's a lot of recipes and it they did such a beautiful job on it. It's really pretty and very functional. There's a healthcare practitioner section. So it's a great thing if you if you um, are curious, if you're spice curious, um, or also if you have your clients who are, you, you want them to increase things like aromatics in their diet and spices. There's a lot of clear strategies around how to do that, depending on what kind of health conditions you're trying to address, or if you just want to do it for fun or whatever. So you can find it wherever you like to buy books. Um, there's also, I also have a limited uh, number of, of um, signed copies that you can buy directly from me. It does cost more to buy them for me because I'm not Amazon, um, but you can find those books anywhere you like to buy books. And uh, and I think that there's also a couple other things I wanted to mention. 
Um, the American Herbalist Guild, I'm the president of the American Herbalist Guild. It's an awesome herb organization. And I'm a volunteer council elected member, but we have a whole wonderful crew. And if you're interested in herbal medicine, if this really interests you, if you join our organization, there's a lot of interesting perks. And right now um, we have a, a coupon code for you all, which is member 20 for $20 off. And that will work until I think the end of the first week of July. Um, so that's member 20 for $20 off. And that will be in the slide deck that you get. And some of the things that we do, we have um, lots of directories for herbalists and schools and chapters. Um, there's chapters all over the country that usually meet in person, uh, not right now, but we have awards that we give out and in a number of different categories. If you if, please feel free to nominate people for that. They don't need to be members to be um, nominated and you don't need to be a member to nominate them. Um, we have a huge number of public webinar archives. So our members, you can just dive into the webinars and there's, um, a lot of webinars that they you can look at. We also have different uh, we community webinars. We have free webinars, so if you're not a member, you can attend them. Um, we have a big, big symposium, so our symposium will be online this fall. Um, and so it's actually the same weekend as the Naha conference was, because I was going to be going to kind of both somehow. Um, and the so if you if you now have a free weekend, then you'll uh you can feel free to join our online symposium we have a an awesome platform and it's going to be very engaging and experiential we have a journal that comes out um and a lot of other really cool stuff and hundreds of hours of audio recording so if you just want to listen to those all the time you can do that too i we do have a covid19 resource page so as all of the integrative health herbal medicine um some aromatherapy things came out, we created a page to just for free access where we have just um, uh, kind of collected them all and we, we have them up there. So this is all free and welcome. There's some really fascinating stuff. We have a, um, a couple of members who have translated some of the Chinese literature and treatments from hospitals in China with herbal medicine and some aromatherapy. Um, so, you know, definitely if you're interested, this is just a public resource. You can check out our um, COVID-19 resource page. So I am, it's, it's been such a pleasure to, to be here tonight. I, you know, I hope that you found something new and I'm sure that I could learn a lot from you around your own practices with nutrition and herbal medicine, but it's a, it's a great thing to dive into and become engaged in. So um, I'm gonna hand it back to Kelly and, um, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Great, that was wonderful. What a, what a really great presentation and what a great presenter you are. I just love your energy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I just love it. And yeah, you know, the and I was laughing like right away when I saw the food pictures, you started making me hungry. So for sure. <laughs> right. But thank you so much for, for being here this evening and taking time to share about uh, one of the most important things in life, and that is good nutrition and taking care of ourselves and also turning us on to the plant uh, superpowers as well. So especially through spices and that we all need to add a little bit more spice to our life. So we all really appreciate that. And thank you very much. You are so welcome. It's been such a pleasure. I just wish I could be there with everybody in person, but this is this is as close as we can get, and that's fun too. Well, we will for the for next year at the conference, exactly. right? So that would be great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.